why was it so easy to get everybody to, you know, uh, put the bandana over their face, take 17 boosters and cut their family members out of their life and stay home for, for 18 months? Why would they do that? Um, I've been very concerned that since 2020, we're entering a sort of permanent fog of war. Yes. And it's very concerning because in a fo- what's the purpose of a fog of war is to confuse people. Mm-hmm. And when you're confused, when you can't see, it's very disconcerting, right? Mm-hmm. And you, you're, you're nervous and you're like flailing about because you're trying to ward off different threats and whatever, but you don't really know what you're doing because you can't see. Mm-hmm. And, and um, if we are in fact in the passion of the church, I guess I would say this. I think it's all encapsulated in the mystery of suffering. If you're going to follow Christ, that means you yeah. must follow him in his sufferings. And those sufferings are not only from external enemies, they're from the brethren within. Ladies and gentlemen, I just had the pleasure of sitting down and recording an amazing and exciting interview with Joshua Charles, very much a Renaissance man, a concert pianist, a presidential speechwriter, all around good guy. And we talked about the war of the Antichrist on the Catholic Church. And you'll see as you watch the interview that we're referring to a book that he published with 10 books. It's a reprint of an old book with a bunch of his editor's notes, which made it much more helpful. And... Um, We talked about the plot to destroy the church through the plan of Freemasonry. And we were only able to get through, I don't know, probably 20 or 30 pages of the book, but we got through a lot and we're going to do another interview again soon. And uh, you're going to love this interview. And before we continue, one thing you'll notice in this interview is that both Josh and I have beards. Now, maybe he hasn't quite reached the heights of uh, beardedness that uh, we find up here in the great white north. But if you are into beards, shameless plug, check out the links in the description for the TKR store where you can find all your beard grooming needs. Go to thekennedyreport.com and visit the TKR store to see our new products, Kennedy's Choice Beard Oil. You can use this on your beard to help with alleviating itchiness, dryness, and irritation of skin. And don't worry, no animals were used in testing this product except for myself. Use Kennedy's Choice Beard Balm for a softer, healthier, manageable beard that is made with natural ingredients. And trust me, I know a thing or two about beards. Visit thekennedyreport.com and check out the TKR store. The links for this are in the description. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited about today's interview. We just recorded the beginning of the interview, but because we're going to talk about the real history of the Illuminati, the Antichrist, the Freemasons, all the Tin Hat conspiracies, the devil jumped in and kicked our friend, Mr. Joshua Charles, off the stream. Shocker. Gremlins in the technology like usual. He is the editor of a book called The War of the Antichrist which was originally published over 120 years ago or so by Monsignor Dillon. He's going to talk about that in this interview. A little bit about Josh. He is a trained concert pianist and a former speechwriter for Vice President Pence and a lot of other things, quite the Renaissance man. Josh, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Kennedy. I've uh, been an admirer of yours for a long time, and so I'm honored to be on here. Well, you're not supposed to admit that because now everyone knows you have bad taste. So That doesn't bode well for you, <laughs> but... But Josh, yeah, well. be- before we start, I wanted to ask one question. Just this is the most important question. We've been texting and stuff, becoming friends, which is great. But I needed to know. You're this like highly educated, very sophisticated man. <laughs> what made you want to dive into this world of uh, traditional Catholicism and become canceled like the rest of us? <laughs> uh, intellectual honesty, I guess. Right. Uh, reading the sovereign pontiffs of the Catholic Church and their warnings for centuries and uh, in the case of this book, I happened to read it during the lockdowns, which was my first Easter as a Catholic, which, uh, as we've discussed, uh, was quite ironic because I came into the church July 13th, 2019 uh, from Protestantism, you know, a Fatima day that was not on purpose by either right. me or my priest. Um, and then my first Easter is, you know, the public celebration of the mass is canceled basically worldwide, uh, which, you know, loving scripture, I only know of one person in scripture who does that. And, uh, so, you know, that's how, <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. I mean, it's, you know, I was just recently speaking at the coalition for canceled priest conference and I was, I think I was telling you this off the air one time, but you know, me being the sort of rad trad guy, I was like, ah, eh, I'm never going to get invited to speak at places with so-and-so and so-and-so. And there I am, you know, the pendulum has swung so far to the left in the church that, you know, if you're a little bit right of center, you're all of a sudden with the motley crew of, uh, of, uh, you know, the canceled type. So I'm there with Jesse Romero and Doug Barry 
15 minutes ago, these guys have, you know, shows on EWTN and they're there with me. So you're in good oh, company. Yeah. You're in good company this well, month. Well, and, and, you know, to your great credit, one of the reasons I think we're becoming friends is I, I like your intellectual honesty because I told you, I remember one of the first things I told you is I don't agree with you on everything. And you responded very funnily by saying, I'm not sure I agree with everything I believe. <laughs> so, so, you, you know, there's a, there's a, an intellectual humility there that I, I find refreshing. So, so well, if I did, if I only yeah. was uh, close to people who agreed with me on everything, I wouldn't be married. So my yeah, wife exactly. doesn't agree with me all the time <laughs> exactly. either. So. Exactly. So ladies and gentlemen, his book here, just so you know, it's in the link to the description of this video, The War of the Antichrist with the Church and Christian Civilization. Uh, as a Tan Books published author myself, I have to say Tan does print a very, very nice book. Um, I think so they did an amazing job on the cover. They did. They did. And, you know, the types, everything. I mean, here's my book, Shameless yeah. Plug. SSPX, the defense, and in this one, you know, I self-published. I did my best, and I and I, I think it's good. But man, the tan hardcover—they do a good job. So they do. Okay, so the Illuminati, Freemasons, you know, uh, secret societies, whatever. All this stuff is just a wacky conspiracy, and you're a nut if you believe in it. You're basically a QAnon, like Jim Caviezel and Sound of Freedom. Um, what do you say to that? Am I onto something, or am I wrong? No, well, I know what you really believe. So you are not wrong, but what you just said is wrong. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, if that's what somebody believes, uh, then they have to believe that centuries of popes were uh, tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. So yeah. if they're willing to admit that, um, then fine. They're intellectually consistent. Uh, but if they're not, and most of the people who make those accusations are not willing to admit that, um, then their position is wrong and inconsistent. Now, I also believe there are some people who, and we'll talk about this throughout, but there's some people who think there's a, ma there's a there are Masons under every rock. Mm -hmm. um, and that's wrong too. And Leo XIII and Monsignor Dillon talk about the danger of this. Uh, I think the great danger of this is that it kind of externalizes the issue of sin. Whereas you and I know that, uh, you know, since I became Catholic from Protestant, I've got all these weird things hanging around statues. And so I have this memento mori on my desk. So I think about yeah. the day of judgment every day death heaven i'm sorry death judgment heaven hell and um and so if we're if that if that somehow is externalized to other people or other forces mm -hmm. we're in a really dangerous spiritual position um so i reject that as well however i will say and we'll talk about this more i'm sure that uh, many of the presuppositions of our civilization now are fundamentally masonic they are and most of the air we breathe uh, were once ideological agenda points to be achieved. Um, and now I would say almost all of them have been achieved. And they were outlined with great specificity by many popes, especially Pope Leo XIII, but not just him, um, because the papal states, when they were the papal states, had their own law enforcement, had their own intelligence service. The Vatican still has an intelligence service, their own diplomatic corps, and they came into possession of a lot of documents and a lot of uh, a lot of names and a lot of people. And so, you know, that was the position of knowledge they were speaking from. Um, and so and I'm, we'll go through it. But when you just lay out the agenda of what of what they were talking about, it's it's point, point, point uh, been happening the last hundred forty or so years. You know, um, I was just listening to a podcast um, with this fellow named Lloyd De Jong. I don't know if you've ever seen him. He's not very well known on YouTube. He's incredible. I'm actually going to try and get him on my show. Um, he lives in Poland, but he's South African. And um, he's he what? goes so, from South Africa. I was, oh, trying to okay. sound like, okay. I was trying to sound like an Afrikaner. Um, okay. Your accents old, are normally really, really good. Well, you know, he's a, he's a blitz, <laughs> blitz booker. But I'm trying okay. to, I, okay. all my old rugby boys, they all talk like that. But <laughs> he, um, he goes through the history of atheism. And it's funny. Um, I think he's Protestant, but he's very pro-Catholic. I don't really know. He's not really clear on it. But he was going through all his thesis and everything, and I'm like, it sounds exactly like this book. And he's going through all these very de detailed, very accurate, very verified sources showing that this history of an uh, atheist Freemasonry, atheist Enlightenment rationalism, this is not a secret. This is a plot to destroy the Catholic Church. This is a plot to destroy civilization. Um, and it's as bad as advertised. We just have to take it seriously. So let's... Let's break down real quick here, because I know this term Illuminati is mentioned in the first probably five or six chapters of the book pretty significantly. People think of Illuminati, they think of Dan Brown, they think of, you know, the Da Vinci Code or whatever, um, and it's just some weird, crazy thing. 
But the Illuminati is a very real thing, and uh, there's plenty of details on that. You want to give us a little background about the uh, Illuminati in the real sense? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in all the details, um, but but essentially what Monsignor Dillon lays out is the Illuminati were uh, essentially invented by a former canon law professor, uh, Adam Weishaupt, uh, you know, sort of Catholic, yeah. um, which is ironic, but but not surprising if you know church history and, and kind of an eschatological, you know, timeline of things um, in 1776. And um, it basically had this agenda to overturn Christendom yep. and to refound it, refound another civilization on alternative lines. And if if I could say what the essence of this new anti-civilization is, is whereas Christendom sought to bring together nature and grace, Freemasonry, which, by the way, Leo XIII and Monster Dillon use as sort of a catch-all term for all occultism. So it's not just you know, the guys at the local lodge who, you know, are, are doing community service. It's much deeper than that, much darker than that. But the essence of all Freemasonry, all occultism is to separate nature from grace mm -hmm. at a civilizational level. So when you look at their agenda item, destroying the spiritual and the temporal authority of the Pope, totally secularizing education, making marriage laws, uh, uh, divorce very easy, making marriage a, merely a business contract. Um, and he talks about it being animated by a socialist communist agenda. Of, of a world republic, sort of the French Revolution extended to the whole world. Um, the, this is all about separating nature from grace on a civilizational level in every element of life. So that that's the essence of it. Yeah, and um, Monsignor Dillon goes on in the book here, um, Illuminati is a term that refers to people who followed a philosophy of Illuminism. It's really, it's, you know, it's just a name. I mean, it's, it's like saying, uh, you know, uh, paparazzi or something. It's just, it's a name that refers to a certain type of person. It's obviously been sort of fictionalized and in, in, in a silly way by the popular culture, but it's a very real sect that had real initiations, had real goals. And interesting tidbit as well. Um, it's, it's interesting you bring up the term how uh, Freemasonry, or we would say Masonic, um, is used as sort of a catch-all for secret societies. There is a distinction to be made between the illuminized Freemasonry and the non-illuminized Freemasonry. This isn't to say non-illuminized is good. None of it's good. But it is interesting to look into the history. I was doing some research a couple years back um, for a book I was thinking of writing about the Illuminati. And um, it was interesting to read these letters from American Freemasons around the turn of the 19th century who were horrified at the beliefs of the illuminized Freemasonry which was mainly continental European, because that hadn't really reached the British uh, diaspora community yet. And um, even though the Freemasons were bad, I mean, there's, there's many reasons. It was condemned before it was Illuminized for obvious reasons of false religion and secrecy and all this kind of stuff. Fine. But the Illuminized Freemasonry was even worse uh, because it brought in basically this resurrection of a Manichaean, Gnostic, Albigensian heresy, where, like you said, splitting grace from nature which ultimately leads to a complete acceptance of, of basically all debauchery, um, of ritual sexual immorality. Um, if you look into the writings of Adam Weishaupt, they even have like two streams of Illuminati. So there's the one for the sort of puritanical types. We'll let them have their morals. And then there's the ones for the ones who want a bunch of concubines and whores and things like that. It's a complete and utter uh, disaster. And it infected... Um, uh, Europe so badly that I think we would most uh, clearly see it as being the animating force or at least the d dark spirit behind the activities of the French Revolution. Would you agree with that? Yeah, um, I would also say, uh, you know, I, I've again, I've not delved into every little detail of the differences, but from the bit I have studied, I honestly, it feels a bit like um, comparing Democrats with establishment Republicans. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. They're kind of, you know, varying degrees of the same poison pill. Mm -hmm. um, I think regular British Freemasonry is as much involved in separating nature from grace as as illuminated Freemasonry. Uh, illuminated Freemasonry is just perhaps more intense, more revolutionary, mm -hmm. as you said. Um, but they're both the same poison pill of nature is sufficient for its own, achieving its own end, eternal, which they still see as a form of eternal life. Right, right. Um, but they don't think that, uh, again, it, it all goes back to the garden. 
Um, I have a section in a book I'm working on now talking about, you know, and I talk about it a little bit in this introduction, this idea I, I coined, you know, I came from Protestantism. So the five main heresies of Protestant, you know, the five points of Calvinism, not all Protestants are Calvinists, but, you know, sola gratia, sola scriptura, sola fide, faith alone, scripture alone, etc. So I came up with this term of sola natura, nature alone. Mm -hmm. And Pope Leo XIII calls it naturalism. Uh, the intellectual component is called rationalism. But it's essentially this belief, again, that nature does not need to be participating in that which is ontologically its origin, but it has the divinity within itself. Mm -hmm. So when you when you hear many popular figures like Oprah and whatnot, they all talk about look in your heart or the divinity is within. Mm -hmm. And this is all forms of occultism. Mm -hmm. um, but it all goes back to the garden. Satan said to our our first parents, you know, eat of the tree of knowledge and you'll become like gods. Well, knowledge is not God. So implicit in that statement is that there's some sort of divinity latent within you that the right gnosis will access and will activate it, so to speak. Um, whereas the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob says, eat from the tree of life, which is in a sense himself. Um, and so that is the great uh, fulcrum point and the great distinction between the Catholic faith and Freemasonry. You know, contrary to what I used to think as a Protestant, um, there's no more grace-based religion than the Catholic faith. Yep. Uh, we believe that unless God has, has filled our souls, is living in our souls, we will not live to eternity. And all of Freemasonry, as I said, is about is about denying that that truth. It's interesting you say that um, more more grace filled or more grace centered. There's nothing more grace centered or grace filled than Catholicism because, yeah, um, I mean that's the sacramental life. It's you know you think you hear this Protestant idea of you know you know sola sola gratia like only grace or only faith, etc. But really, I mean that's it's not really what it's like at all. I mean, in Catholicism, it's this, it's this idea that you have to basically every day or every week or whatever, continually renew your sort of participation in the sanctifying grace that the church offers. Otherwise you'll lose your soul. Well, and this is where it gets very interesting on the political societal level. So grace, what it, we our, our soul is two main powers, faculties. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the precise Thomistic term, but our intellect and our will. Yeah. Our intellect is how we know, and our will is how we make a decision. Uh, these are two powers which human beings alone among physical creatures possess. Yeah. And so grace is what enlightens our intellect and strengthens our will mm -hmm. so that we can love God and love neighbor from the heart. That's essentially what it is. And what the Catholic faith has always said, St. Augustine, of course, famously articulates this. So does the Council of Trent. So, so does the church throughout the last 2,000 yeah. years. Our hearts, our intellect, and our will cannot be directed to God without that grace. Yep. And so when masonry is applying that on the civilizational level, that's why they want to separate the church from the state. Mm -hmm. Because the state is analogous to this. If the state does not have the guidance of the church, not only will it not perceive the natural law, even the natural law, it will not legislate even according to the natural law. So like all of us in original sin, we don't fall into total depravity. That was a Protestant error. We maintain some semblance of natural goodness, mm -hmm. but in many of our dispositions, we fall below even the level of nature. So states yes. who are totally separated from the church are not only unable to legislate according to the natural law, but they begin legislating that which is unnatural, which Romans one, look outside your window. That's where we are mm -hmm. because we're not connected. There's no life force of grace, you know, to speak in a <laughs> life force, you know, speaking of Star Wars terms, you know, but, um, but yeah, that, that's essentially you, you apply, you apply what the individual soul requires and why it needs grace. You apply it at the civilizational level and you do the reverse and that's occultism. That's Freemasonry. Uh, Peter Kraft, famous, uh, Catholic philosopher. Yeah, love him. He's, he's hilarious. And, um, <laughs> he just has that. Yeah. He's got that sort of Northeast almost almost jewish sense of humor you know what i mean it's like it's just <laughs> very so, dry so, yeah. so sardonic um, yeah but he said um he summarized thomas aquinas with this idea that grace perfects nature he says here's what it means sin makes you stupid <laughs> and it's yeah, true exactly um i wrote that in my book terror of demons um which you can find a link to this video as well viewers it's the my book from tan books and and um you know, you see this in the life of a person. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote here in just a sec where you talk about sure. church and state because this will this will play into it because this is something you actually wrote in the editor's introduction, which is your own words, not the words of Monsignor Dillon. 
And I should also add before I continue, what Josh did in here, because this book was published, you know, about 20 years before the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. There you go. Um, there were a lot of these references that in their day, it would have been saying like Pelosi, Biden, Trudeau, whatever. You would have just known who it was, but we don't know who those people are. So he put a lot yeah. of these editor's notes, which make it much more readable. So, so that was really helpful. Um, but, um, in, you know, we talk about grace perfecting nature, sin making you stupid. As our society gets further and further away, as individuals in our society get further and further away from practicing the faith, from living further away from a state of grace, because it's kind of incremental. It's kind of like, like obviously one mortal sin is enough to damn your soul. But the Council of Trent teaches, of course, that you don't lose your faith automatically when you commit a mortal sin. Then you wouldn't have yeah. the desire to go back to confession. That wouldn't make any sense. But, and this is scriptural, this is in tradition as well, the more and more you dive deeper and deeper into mortal sin, the more fixed your will becomes against God. Yes. Um, to basically, I mean, we're not counting anything out of God's miracles and all this kind of stuff, but from a perspective of how we can understand it, there is almost a point of no return. There is a point of, you know, it's kind of like what Jim Caviezel has been saying about his interactions with this child trafficking stuff. You encounter these people and it's like barring some insane miracle from God, they, they, they are in hell and they've fixed yeah. their will against God. So as our society goes further and further and further away and as individuals as we do that, you see dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber legislation. You know, you see men like Justin Trudeau, the Fuhrer of my country, you know, despite the politicians, it's a very nice place to live. And some of the things I see come out of his mind, some of the things I see uh, his ministers say in parliament, it's like watching idiocracy. It's, it's yeah. not just, it's, it, it's, it's comical because they, yeah. they're, they're literally stupid. <laughs> And yeah. I don't know how else to explain it, but they're so far from God that they can't even reason anymore. Well, I've I've frequently noted that many of the uh, most enlightened pagans, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, you know, far from perfect. They didn't have Christ, but they got awfully close to many truths of the yes. faith through natural reason. They would be shocked at mm -hmm. where we are now, which honestly, this mirrors, I would say, uh, how scripture talks about people who have become apostate. Yes. And scripture uniformly talks about people who have become apostate as um, as worse than before. Yes. You know, and so think now again, if we're going to continue this analogy of from the individual soul to the civilizational soul, so to speak, which is, mm -hmm. I guess, is kind of platonic. I think Plato does the same yes. thing in the Republic. Um, then we're talking about a civilization that has rejected Christ is in a far worse state than a civilization that didn't know him to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. Uh, I'll read this quote here in a sec, but uh, that's why we were talking about the book, The Everlasting Man, the other day. Yeah. That's something that um, Chesterton talks about. And he shows, um, even though pagan societies have many issues, there was this prefigurement of understanding true worship and desiring that in the notion of sacrifice that they had. So yes. it's funny, you know, a pagan sacrifice of animals and humans, as abhorrent as that is, they understand that for the forgiveness of sin and the pleasing of God, the gods, is necessary for there to be a blood sacrifice. They just have the wrong one. Whereas yeah. other false religions post-Catholicism, Protestantism, Islam, etc., they have a completely foreign understanding of worship because it doesn't even include sacrifice, which is a very interesting concept. But, okay, so here's... Well, your, if here's, I can make oh, one sorry, quick yeah. observation, if I can make yeah. one quick observation... They, they, they do. But here's the thing. What's so interesting about human nature, I'm working on a book uh, with Scott Hahn about the American founding. Mm -hmm. And um, so for hopefully publication for next year. And so without going, you know, switching to another book, um, the American founders were brilliant in some ways, but they were horrible philosophers. They yes. didn't understand what human nature was, what its eternity was, what its destiny, was, what its telos was. And so they 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 uh, mislegislated in some respects. And so uh, same thing with communists. They have a fundamental misunderstanding of human nature. Mm -hmm. Why do I mention that? Because human, you know, what's that line from? Was it Horace? He says, you can you know, you can push human nature out, but it'll come right back in something like that from one of his satires. You know, so you can you can act as if man can be an a religious creature, an atheist creature. Mm -hmm. um, you can act as if you can legislate for man without any attention paid to his final end. But at some point his instinct toward that final end, his instinct toward religion will manifest in other ways. Mm -hmm. So with communism, it's the total, totalizing state 
that takes the place of God. And with, with, with a lot of modern people who have rejected the notion of sacrifice in religion, they make up for it with things like abortion, which they yes. don't see as religious. They see it as just kind of their natural right. Yes. And so anyway, I completely agree with your point, but I would also say that it manifests in uglier, more horrific ways by its it denial. Yeah. Well, now they're sacrificing cows and all that kind of stuff for their climate, yeah. right? You know, yeah. It's the same thing. Okay, so here's the quote. Ten minute preamble. We're finally going to get to the quote. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, so in, in the inter- editor's introduction, and I've read ninety five percent of this book, so I'm I'm really I'm really into it. But um, you go through fr- Freemasonry's ultimate goal is the destruction of Christendom, and then here's one of the ways, and it's a separation of church and state, popular sovereignty, and religious indifferentism. So I'll read a quick quote here, and then we can spitball off of there. So. Based on its naturalistic principles, Freemasonry necessarily denies the existence of any supernaturally constituted society, important, namely the Catholic Church. As such, it denies that the Church is the infallible teacher of faith and morals, and thus endeavors to entirely separate it from the state, which it insists can and should exist on an entirely natural foundation. And you go on to say, this is made clear by Pope Leo XIII, and here's his quote, um, by a long and preserving labor, they, the Freemasons, endeavor to bring about this result, namely that the teaching office and authority of the church may become of no account in the civil state. And for this same reason, they declare to the people and contend that church and state ought to be altogether disunited. By this means, they reject from the laws and from the commonwealth the wholesome influence of the Catholic religion. And they consequently imagine that states ought to be constituted without any regard for the laws and precepts of the church, end quote. So this is the, this is the goal of one of the major goals of Freemasonry primary to go after the papacy is very important. But in order to do this, they have to go. Uh, they have to push the separation of church and state. I have always thought the separation of church and state which didn't make any sense from a basic pers- le- psychological level, because I thought to myself, if I was a if I was a minister, I'd, I couldn't separate me from me. So I couldn't separate yeah. like I would think like a Catholic. So it's like just this, even just on a psychological level, it's impossible to not have at least religion in the state because the people who run the state may or may not be religious. But that's a very simple understanding. Why do they go after the church and state separation thing so hard and why is it so important? Well, partly for the reason they stated before that in the same way the individual soul requires grace for its intellect to be enlightened and its will strengthened. Um, the society, human society is the same way. The, the legislator will not perceive the natural law, let alone the divine law, without the assistance of grace, without the teaching office of the church. Uh, this is a timeless Catholic teaching going back to the ancient church. Um, now, to throw a little bit of a, you know Protestant apologetics in here, I love my Protestant brethren. Um, I learned many good things from them that, you know, taken to their logical conclusion, brought me to the Catholic Church. Um, you know, loving scripture, loving Jesus. Uh, um, and so, but many of these trends ultimately began with Protestantism. Here's what I mean by that. Yeah. So one of the things that struck me when I would read scripture as a Protestant is all these guarantees that Jesus gave to the church. You know, my, my you know, whatever you bind on earth and, and, and loose on earth will be bound, on, bound in heaven, loosed in heaven. You know, the gates of hell will not prevail. I'll guide you into all truth. Paul calling the church the pillar and the bulwark of the truth. Uh, he never refers to scripture that way. Obviously, we believe scripture is a pillar and, and bulwark of the truth. But Paul doesn't refer to scripture that way. He refers to the church that way. And, um, you know, Daniel's prophecy of the church, Daniel 2 and whatnot, as this mountain that, you know, the stone that hits the base of the of the statue, uh, you know, the Roman Empire, the cl- feet of iron and clay and fills the whole earth and it has no end and whatnot. So I noticed immediately, like, why would Jesus give these promises? Well, it's really simple. Natural societies, you know, families, countries, empires, they they come and go all the time. You know, the Roman Empire is not here anymore. The Ming Dynasty is not here anymore. The Mongolian Empire of uh, uh, Ganges and Kublai Khan is not here anymore. Those are naturally constituted societies. That is not what Jesus constituted when he founded the church. He founded a supernatural society uh, uh, to which he attached his own name and his own permanence. Um, and so that's the difference between a state that is purely naturally constituted as not needing that supernatural assistance of grace. Um, and, and, and so not relying on the perfect, uh, supernaturally constituted society of the church and the church, which, uh, has outlasted all these societies. And so if, if a naturally constituted society rejects that, 
they're literally rejecting access to the highest truths. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And um, it's it's like it's like the uh, it's like uh, it's like the impermanent refusing to rely on the permanent. Yeah, yeah, that's you right. Know, the, the the changing refusing to rely on the unchanging. Yep, and um, in the next point, but, but a lot you... of the sorry to finish the point. So, sorry, yeah. I, was, I was like, where was I going with that? But Protestantism denied this essentially. Yes, Protestantism. Uh, there's many forms of it. So you know, <laughs> some Protestants will complain to me. Well, not all. It's like okay, that's kind of the point. Not all of you believe this. That it's like that's kind of the point of why I'm Catholic. No, um, yeah, exactly. I can't cover every form of Protestantism, but many of them believed in what they call an invisible church. They, they, which, which yes. made the church an abstraction. Mm -hmm. It made the church. It, it's been amazing coming from Protestantism to the Catholic Church how much it concretizes mm -hmm. your sense of being a Christian. Like I belong to a visible society, not just this abstraction that I refer to as the church, where a bunch of people hold, you know, vaguely, you know, Christophilic beliefs that may be contradicting one another, but they're still part of the church. You know. It's 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 uh, but but this started with Protestantism, this sort of abstracting of the church, and then what immediately happened after that was a more concrete philosophy of the state, yes. you know, which is, is very interesting. And so you know, ideas of well, consequences, as Richard Weaver said. Well, if if people take a a strong look at history, like the French Revolution, the atheist revolutions, so so and so on and so forth, these are very much the philosophical and spiritual children of the ideas of the Protestant uh, Reformation, so-called, because, um, well, for one, I mean, this idea that you can interpret the scriptures any way that you want, uh, I know that's a little bit of, a, of a, a superficial way of looking at it, but ultimately that is one of the main tenets of Protestantism. I mean, this, this will very much make the scriptures irrelevant. You know, even if you're a believing Protestant, you have really no basis to say somebody else has to do what you think they should do. Um, in addition, when you take away the sacraments, uh, it becomes a very Gnostic practice where essentially your interior transformation, which only you can experience, is the fruit of the scriptures that you interpret yes. the way that you want. Therefore, who's to say that someone else doesn't have a religious experience where they see Jesus differently and they happen to find that in Islam? You know, this is, this is, this is what brings us to modernism. You know, this idea that you have vital imminence which Pius X talked about, where uh, your experience of religion is a barometer of the truth of that religion. Yes. And, and Protestantism requires that. I mean, all, you know, we love the song Amazing Grace, and it's a great song. You know, there's a recent, there's a, there's a metal singer I really like. He does covers, and he did a metal cover of it a month. It's got like 5 million views. It's, it's crazy. Okay, this is our song. first major disagreement. This is our first major disagreement. <laughs> you, you, think, you think metal music is worthy of the name music? Well, I, I, a couple bands. I like Sabaton. All right, me, all right, all right. When I'm hitting my heavy bag, they sing songs about the First right. World War, and uh, and the, the they actually have a song about the um, establishment of the Swiss Guard. They're anyway. Oh, okay. But um, anyway, I like to listen to it when I'm when I'm working out. But the point is, um, this song, Amazing Grace, great song. What it's it about? It's about a feeling. Like it's it's yeah. it, it's a modernist anthem. It's like I was saved, I was lost, now I'm found, and I'm super happy about it. Let's all cry and love Jesus. And that's a good sentiment, but if that's the barometer of your religious truth, you're going to have major issues. And this is what we find in the goal of uh, the secularization of society. It becomes a complete Gnostic mess. And this leads yeah. us to the next point, though, and the destruction of Christendom. Before you do that, oh, can yes. I make one more point? Sure. Uh, do you know Dr. Alan Fimister? The name, but not the work. Brilliant man. You should get, he's become a very good friend of mine over the last year and a half, two years. He's a seminary professor. I think he's got like two PhDs, two masters. He's an historian, a lawyer, and a theologian. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. Plus he's got a British accent. So that automatically makes uh, us Americans makes much you know, smarter, swoon yes. and whatnot. So anyway, but he made this point, I think it was with, um, on a, on a podcast, uh, with Eric Ibarra, um, and your favorite Michael Lofton <laughs> back in the day. Um, but he made the point that, um, you know, by Protestantism, you know, essentially was based on on private judgment. Yes. But but even by natural reason, we can know that God exists. Mm -hmm. And if we can know that God exists, we know that there would be some me some mechanism by which he would reveal the true religion to the world and how he ought to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. So but if your only mechanism for knowing that truth is through private judgment, then that implies that God doesn't exist because God has not provided a mechanism by which you can know what those truths are with mm -hmm. moral certainty. 
And yeah. so by making scripture subordinate to private judgment, you, you, what he'll say is you've made theism yes. uh, essentially impossible in a society because you've made God, the idea of God incoherent yeah. because God has not provided a mechanism to provide for telling us how he ought to be worshiped, which we won't know how he ought to be worshiped through natural reason, but we can know through natural reason that he does need to be worshiped and that there would be a way that he ought to be worshiped. I mean, as you were saying with the pagans, you know, they still have the sense of sacrifice and and accountability, you know, so. Well, I would add to that, even with just natural law, with understanding the natural law, not only will we know that God must be worshipped, we would know that because justice is every man getting what he's due, that there's not only a necessity to sacrifice to God, but there would be the optimal sacrifice. We would know that there would be the true way to do it. Even with, like, if we just follow the reason through, even without the scriptures, even without tradition, we would know, okay, if sin is the equivalent of taking $1,000 away from somebody, then I have to give exactly $1,000 back and retribution. Yes. Uh, So it wouldn't be, well, as long as we just give them something back. No, there would be one particular way of sacrificing, which would be necessary, and that would be the only way that would be sufficient. And this would mean there'd be one true religion that offered the true sacrifice. It's baked into the nature of human human beings. It is. Well, and the catechism says that the, the, the purpose of the magisterium is so that the true, the true faith could be professed without error. That's yes. the point of it. So that there'd be, a, there'd be a moral certainty in that. But if, if your only mechanism for knowing what the truths of the faith are is private judgment, that you've done away with that. And so yeah. by doing away with uh, divine revelation in that way, you've done away with theism in public life. And hence you lead to the rapid secularization of the of the temporal order, which as Alan says, you know, welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and this, let's, let's move on to this point here. This is one of the goals of the Illuminati and the Freemasons, um, or at least one of the symptoms of the beliefs, specific goals of the Illuminized Freemasons for sure, um, but moral decay. And um, the reason is, is because moral decay, see, this is, this is, you gotta, I'll give it an, an example. If you look at communism in the Soviet Union, communism is just a form of Freemasonry. It's just a form of this secret society, nonsense, Gnostic. It's all just, it's just politicized of this secret society cult to control everything. It's all the same. And it's, well, it's all from Satan, but it's all very much the same in the way it operates. It's these rings within rings within rings of influence and suspicion and, and backstabbing and control and manipulation. And it's all the same thing. And, but one of the things that these communists who are just like Freemasons and often are, one of the things that they always do is they have to destabilize the population with a certain amount of moral decay. And why is this? Well, as we said, sin makes you stupid. But not only that, what sin does is it makes you unhinged. It makes you helter-skelter because you don't have control. Obviously, we all sin in a sense of sin happens, but in this economy of sin, this, this consistent framework and infrastructure of sin, this makes us slaves to our own passions, which means we're much easily, more easily manipulated. People wonder, why was it so easy to get everybody to, you know, uh, put the bandana over their face, take 17 boosters, and cut their family members out of their life and stay home for, for 18 months? Why would they do that? Because it's, it's very simple. My, one of my priests, um, when we were doing Zoom conferences back when the lockdown started, uh, you know, he was saying, what's the most... What's the biggest threat facing humanity? He says, it's not climate change. It's not COVID. He said, it's sin. And and the point is, is that because of our sinfulness as a society, we are so, and I'm sinful too. We're all sinful, but we're so sinful. Like everything from the pride parades to the, you know, the drag queen stuff to just even the usury, just everything, the exploitation of workers and children. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's at every single layer of our godless society. That when, a, when, when it's time to manipulate people, it's very, very simple. You scare them with death and say, here's your pleasures as long as you do what you're told. So stay home, watch your Netflix, watch your pornography, order your takeout, let the slaves go to work. This is, it's, it's, it is simply that. People wonder why, why couldn't I wake these people up? Because you can't wake them up to the problems that are that are lording over them until you wake them up to the sin that's lording over them. That's what do you think? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's Romans one. Um, and, and we know that one of God's judgments on people, individuals and societies is he, uh, he refrains from sending them graces. That's right. Like he, 
grace is gratuitous. He doesn't owe it to us. Um, and so we see this pattern all throughout Israel's history. We see it uh, in, in the history of uh, individual uh, souls in the church throughout time. We see it with the history of Judas. Um, everything, you know, I heard a phrase one time, everything in life is habit. So make sure yours are good ones. Yeah. And if you've habituated, it, it really does. You know, I've, I, I always try to think when I'm, you know, talking about some subject on a podcast or whatever, I always try to think, okay, what is the essence? I have a dear mentor of mine who's been very successful in political communications, fundraising. And if, if anybody wants to use this, this free advice from a very successful person, um, he calls it the 50 word or less rule. And he's like, distill your communication objective down to 50 words or less. Hmm. And it's an extremely helpful exercise. And so that's why I really think it is a simple when it comes to Freemasonry and what the hmm. issue is. It really is as simple as separating nature from grace, mm -hmm. uh, dimming the intellect and weakening the will. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, yep. why? Because all these things dispose us to hell. That, That's right. It's really that simple. When you're habituated to to choosing, it's very interesting. I have a friend. He's not a believer. He kind of has a sort of vague belief in God, but a, a very dear friend of mine for many, many years. And he was getting into Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. And he was really liking Jordan Peterson. And, the, you know, this friend, you know, has has done things that, uh, you know, wouldn't be in a lore accord with Christian morality. I'll put it that way. Um, but we're, we're very close. And so we were talking about this and I was basically telling him this whole intellect and will thing. And I said, I think this is why he's liking Jordan Peterson so much, because Jordan Peterson doesn't explain it in a Thomistic fashion. Um, but but essentially the way I described it is when you know what right is, but you choose otherwise, mm -hmm. you get those further and further apart. Yes. And step by step, it's like you become a split personality. That's right. I actually think that's one of the reasons, I mean, human beings were insecure, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they, they went to go cover their nakedness. So sin makes all of us insecure to one degree or another. But I think it's why we're in a particularly insecure age where everybody has to be affirmed in absolutely everything, mm -hmm. because intellect and will is so far apart. It, it, it just makes you exposed and insecure. It's like, you, it's like, you know, I think most people know more than they will ever admit openly uh, that they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. Of course. And so it's like, instead of listening to that voice of conscience, which indeed is very quiet in, in a lot of people, but instead of listening to it, they want the world and its adulations to drown out that conscience and to affirm them in what they're doing to, to keep the split going even longer. And so I think that's what we're experiencing on a societal level. And actually, I don't have the quote in front of me. It, it's actually shocking. Leo the Thirteenth says explicitly in here, I say, I'm going to paraphrase. He essentially says that they want to do this moral decay because at the end stage of their plot, it will make people more obedient. That's essentially yes. what he says. Yep. And so, you know, I'm reading this. I'm why well, I had read Leo the Thirteenth before, but then combining it with Monsignor Dillon, you know, reading this in 2020, I'm like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. You know, I, I'm not here to say, you know, certainly not defide or anything. You know, this is the absolute end stage and Antichrist is right around the corner. You know, I have my suspicions, uh, but but I'm not here to say that. But but it was an unprecedented situation. As I said, my first Easter as a Catholic, you know, you and yeah. I have talked about, you know, the public celebration of the mass essentially worldwide was canceled. And there's literally one person in Scripture who does that. It's the yes. Antichrist. That's right. Well, here's the quote. I think I have it. Oh, great. Um, I'll read the um, uh, for since generally no one is accustomed to obey crafty and clever men so submissively as those whose soul is weakened and broken down by the domination of the passions, there have been in the sect of the Freemasons some who have plainly determined and proposed that, artfully and set of, of set purpose, the multitude should be satiated with a boundless license of vice, which is to say, get him to sin all the time as when this had been done, it would easily come under their power and authority for any acts of daring. Yep. Make the people sinful and exactly. slaves to their passions, and you will get them to stay home for 18 months and wear a face diaper. Exactly. Exactly. That, thank you. That was, that was the quote. That's that'll right. be the, that'll be the, uh, that'll be when I write one day, when I write a history book, uh, hypothetically, I'll talk about this four or five year period we've lived through the period of sinful people wearing face diapers that'll encapsulate the entire yeah. time. <laughs> well, acts of daring. That's what he, that's what, that's what I'm referring to. It's like if, if, if COVID and everything that happened in that, in that era, which I still think we're in, if it yes. wasn't one act of daring after another, um, you know, what was it? You know, it was, insane. it's exactly what Leo the 13th laid out. 
And so, um, and again, when, when we saw the, the cancellation of the mass, look, I do believe there are goodwilled people who are genuinely yes, yes, confused. I agree with that. And so I'm not, I don't want to put myself in a position where I'm just blanket condemning absolutely everybody. You I know? give people, I give people like a, a first lockdown buffer. That yes, first three fair. or four months, you're just like figuring it out. Okay. But after that, we got to read some books. You got to yeah. read some articles. Yeah. Yeah. But we saw the same essential problem there. It was yes. the separation of nature from grace. And again, when you separate nature from grace, it's not that they remain sort of neutral in their respective positions. It's nature starts to think it is superior to grace. This is why we saw, you know, in the United States, you probably saw you know, essential businesses. Yes. Uh, churches were not and mm -hmm. and strip clubs and Home Depot and whatnot were, yep. you know. So it's like we, we, we clearly saw the soul as less important than the body. Yeah. Yeah. Which is our whole civilization. You know, you, you take that one principle and you put it through every aspect of civilization, Western civilization now, and you see that that's, that's the underlying principle. That's right. Okay. We have 14 minutes. So let's, <laughs> let's finish off with, uh, and we'll have to do it. Well, this will hopefully be the first of many. We talk a lot, uh, on texting and things like that. We can parlay this into some interesting shows. Um, yeah. what are the major, um, goals of the free, free, well, David L. Gray, wonderful suits, by the way, I think he's one of the best dressed men in Catholic media. <laughs> um, we had a pleasure of meeting at a canceled priest conference. He was a pleasure to be around. Um, I was, was just telling me, a few a month or so ago. Okay. Well, he was telling me, he's like that word Freemasonic to someone who has studied masonry is like not a real word. And it's like nails yeah. on a chalkboard. I was like, okay, I won't say it. So I won't say Freemasonic, David. Okay. The Masonic plot. Um, is the destruction of the papacy. So in this age of, well, let's, let's look at this two ways. You know, you and I would be traditional Catholics. Obviously, we understand that there are some problems. There's, the, you know, there's some problems in Rome. And uh, it's very easy for Catholics who recognize these issues to kind of get into a... Um, in a state where they actually don't, where they lose their affection for the papacy. But that's extremely mm -hmm. dangerous. The papacy as such, in principle, okay, individual claimants, yes, there are men with problems. But the papacy as the papacy and the man who represents that office is so fundamental to the stability of civilization. We have no idea yeah. the disaster that, that, uh, that awaits a world without the papacy. And you know who knows this? All of secular society, which exactly. is why when the Pope says something, when JP2, who was no traditionalist, but when he would say something pro-life, oh, this medieval, you know, backwards, crazy person wanting to make women slaves. It's like JP2 is not even that conservative, <laughs> but yeah. they hate the papacy. And then Francis, oh, he said, who am I to judge? The Catholic Church has changed their position on homosexuality. They, the world knows it needs the validation of the papacy because the world... Is, is under Satan's control, as Scripture tell us. You know, the prince yeah. of this world, the the prince of this world needs the king of the universe and his servant to validate what he's doing in a narcissistic fit of satanic pride. What are your yes. comments on that? <laughs> you just throw me uh, softballs, Kennedy. Um, <laughs> so I'm actually working on a book on this as well. To, you know, I've I've been studying the topic of eschatology with the fathers for a long time. This could definitely be another show. Uh, it's very related to the Freemasonry thing. Maybe we'll talk about that in more detail yes. in a follow-up because um, it's an extremely deep subject. So um, how to phrase it? I think here would be the quick way to put it. Uh, one of the reasons I became Catholic was not only because the tes testimony of Christians through the ages, but the testimony of the enemies of Christianity. And uh, there's much I love among our Eastern Orthodox brethren. Yeah, me too. Um, there's a there's some there's a good deal of truth among some of our Protestant brethren. So, yep. what 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 is good, true, and beautiful, we love, and we say just come home. But uh, but these occult societies did not identify either of them as the chief target. No. They identified the papacy as the chief target. And a quick side note. Um, so a term you're hearing a lot these days, and I think it's it's good. I've talked about and, and researched a lot myself, but the passion of the church. Yes. Um, even as we're talking, I'm like, oh gosh, where do I even begin with this? Because I, I, so I, I think I think there's a, a really a, a huge need right now to um, sort of found a more coherent eschatology theology of eschatology 
um, well, I guess eschatology is theology, <laughs> um, on, on Scripture and the Fathers. I think too many mm-hmm. Catholics rely too heavily on private revelation. Me too. Um, I, we can use private revelation, but as the cherry on top of the cake, uh, not, as, not as the cake itself. And so I have found so much in Scripture and the Fathers. I've lectured on this topic of the catacon. Maybe some of your audience have heard that. It's the Greek term for restrainer. St. Mm-hmm. Paul uses it in 2 Thessalonians 2. And basically, St. Paul says there's this restrainer that is holding back the coming of Antichrist. But no, but there's this restrainer that holds back the coming of Antichrist. And, um, and so there's been a lot of debate about what is this restrainer. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge topic. I won't presume to go into all of it right now. But what I have suggested in a lecture I gave on this topic is that we can identify the restrainer through a hermeneutical pattern in Scripture that I call uh, restrain, release, return. Restrain refers to the binding of Satan, which mm-hmm. uh, I think Paul talks about implicitly in Second Thessalonians 2. Yes. Jesus talks about in the Gospels. And then Apocalypse 20 talks about in sort of its grand overview of history. It talks at the beginning that Satan is restrained. The fathers routinely identify this with Satan being uh, restrained by the passion and resurrection of our Lord and the power that flows from that, which, by the way, would include the sacraments. So That's just right. a little necessarily hint before so. I'd be gone. Necessarily so. Yeah. 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 And so because that's where the power of the sacraments comes from is the passion and and the resurrection. Um, And so and then uh, restrain release. This is the period where Satan is released. Apocalypse 20 talks about it. Second Thessalonians 2 implies it when it talks about the the restrainer being removed, withdrawn, and then the Antichrist coming. Um, I would say that it also shows up in Jesus's parables and Daniel and many other places. So that's that's too big a topic for right now. Um, And then return. This is the return of Christ which we also see in Second Thessalonians 2, we see in Apocalypse 20, and we see in Daniel 12, for example. And so I believe this pattern, restrain, release, return, can actually reveal a lot more about the identity of this catacomb, this restrainer, than, than we've previously been able to do. Um, and to the extent this may be correct, I'm only arriving at it because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, uh, the fathers, many of whom identified the catacomb as somehow related to the Roman Empire, yeah. Um, St. Pope Leo the Great, and then following him, St. Thomas Aquinas, who said that this Roman Empire was not just the temporal pagan Roman Empire, but with the coming of the faith had been kind of lifted up into this spiritual empire of the Catholic faith. And again, the typical, the Christendom, the, the theology of Christendom is not, when we say the church, we're not just referring to the spiritual hierarchy. This is a very common error. We're speaking about the, the spiritual hierarchy with the laity. So that was where the two swords came from. You have the spiritual sword of the the priestly hierarchy and the temporal sword of the laity. Those two together was what was what the church is. It's still what it is. It's still the church. Now, the church, like a body, like we don't speak out of our foot. Right. We have a mouth. Right. So the spiritual hierarchy is like the mouth of the church. Right. They're like the brain of the church, I guess you could say. I mean, that's not a perfect analogy, but you get my point. So so lady can be a foot. They can be a stomach. They can be whatever. But they're not the mouth. That's that's Peter and, and the apostles. Um, and so I believe this together is what Christendom I- is, and it's the restrainer. And of course, the Pope is the preeminent representative of that. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's a whole lot, man, I'm sorry, this, it, it, I'm working on a book on it for a reason. I've had a lot of friends beg me to, to read about it or to write about it. But, um, but yes, essentially, the, the Masons always said, as St. Leo, uh, well, I think he's a saint, sorry, Freudian slip. I think personally think he's a saint, but Pope Leo XIII, said that they wanted to do. They said they wanted to undo everything the Supreme Pontiffs had established for the sake of religion. That was their goal. Um, And then one other point here, there's an old rabbinic tradition about the foundation stone in the temple. Um, Brant Petrie has an amazing lecture about all this, about the Jewish roots of the papacy. Mm -hmm. The foundation stone, it's still there. It's covered by the Dome of the Rock and the Temple Mount. And it was seen as the stone that was kind of keeping hell closed, closing hell. And kind of capping it. Well, if that foundation stone is removed, hell spews forth. Yeah, that's right. And so the idea that if you remove the papacy in some way, now we believe the papacy will endure to the end. What exactly that will look like, we're not entirely sure. There's various theories about it. That's another topic to go into. But but St. Paul does speak of this catacomb being withdrawn, it, no longer restraining. And people like uh, Henry Cardinal Manning, an English cardinal mm-hmm. from the 19th century, he wrote an, an amazing series of books about this where he talks about he believes that this will happen, that, that uh, the papacy won't go away, 
but that it's it's um, it's uh, presiding over Christendom will come to an end. That the great apostasy is, in fact, all these temporal powers revolting from the spiritual power, uh, which is why I personally think we're in the midst, perhaps even the final stages of the great apostasy. Um, but anyway, that's that's a huge topic, as you know. Well, so. um, this will lead us into part two. Um, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, exactly. we've only gotten through the first 17 and a half pages of the book. Um, You've said 17 twice now, Kennedy. Are you are you trying to cryptically tell ooh, us you're... 17, 17. Kidding. I'm a crypto mason. Actually, <laughs> um, so you can probably see vaguely behind me, there's these foam pads that I use. This is my sound studio and my YouTube studio. I do record audiobooks here. By the way, shameless plug, if anybody wants any voiceover work done and you want to pay a Catholic rather than some anti-Catholic whack job, uh, link in the description to this video. You can email me, and I'll uh, I can do a variety of accents and all voice. those sorts of things. Thank you. I've got a face <laughs> for radio and a voice for podcasts. But um, um, so uh, my old office, I had foam in this like checker pattern on my wall just for some hotspots for some echoing. There were people in the comments who said that checker pattern is Illuminati. Kennedy is really Illuminati, and I was like, it's just foam on the wall, dude. <laughs> Anyway. Can I make one quick comment on yeah. this? I told a friend recently, I've been concerned. This would be a whole other topic, maybe in part two. I've been part concerned. Seven. That's in, part 17. That's in, yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. Um, man, you're really rattling those QAnon guys now. Um, I've been very concerned that since 2020, we're entering a sort of permanent fog of war. Yes. And it's very concerning because in a fo what's the purpose of a fog of war is to confuse people. And when you're confused, when you can't see, it's very disconcerting, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you're, you're nervous and you're like flailing about because you're trying to ward off different threats and whatever, but you don't really know what you're doing because you can't see. Mm -hmm. And, and um, if we are, in fact, in the passion of the church, this, ah, man, it's such a profound topic. Um, it's one of the reasons I, I came from Protestantism as well. I guess I would say this. I think it's all encapsulated in the mystery of suffering. If you're going to follow Christ, that means you yeah. must follow him in his sufferings. And those sufferings are not only from external enemies, they're from the brethren within. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. while there's a th this, this willingness to suffer must increase dramatically during mm -hmm. periods of fog of war. So when it comes to like this QAnon stuff, I'm actually very worried. Like I said, this it could be another topic. I'm actually, this is utterly Gnostic garbage. It's totally I Gnostic. I do think there's grains of truth in it. Don't get me wrong. Grains of truth. Um, there's actually stories from throughout church history of occult witchcraft sorcery that relies on killing children yes. and all that sort of stuff like that. That's real. There, yep. There is a very big element of truth there, but I'm very worried. You know, there's a lot of talk about awakening these days. Yes. The great um, awakening. It's very Gnostic and yes. I'm, I'm extremely concerned. It will lead, um, it will lead people uh, in a hellbound direction. I'll just It'll put lead it that people way. people to perdition. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's a whole other topic, but, but the alter, but a lot of this is coming from our Protestant brethren. We mm -hmm. love them. We want them to come home, but a lot of it's coming from them. And, and so for Catholics, the key right now is to be with St. John and our lady at the cross. That's right. Um, and, and to, to grow comfortable with lack of comfort. That's right. Um, frankly, uh, otherwise, you know, you'll go to perdition. We'll all go to perdition as well. So, yep. I did a, um, back when I worked for the Fatima center, I did a video on the dangers of conspiracy theories and I did it in like early 2021. And a lot of people were upset with me. And I just said, listen, anything to make you just anything to keep your, anything to take your focus away from the cross is not good. Yeah. So whether or not this seems Christian, whether or not this seems like it's true, if you're putting your hope in a Messiah that's going to come from this or that, or there's a white knight coming from here or there, or, you know, uh, you're seeing the mystery of iniquity in this one particular industry rather than in the spiritual reality. It's just like, these are dangerous things and they usually are true. Like, I mean, if it's 99% true and 1% arsenic, you're still going to die. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be really careful. Well, um, I'm a Girardian. I'm a Girardian, Rene Girardian. In, in many ways. Yeah. yeah, Rene Girard, and he talks about the phenomena of scapegoating. And yes. to bring us back full circle to what I said at the very beginning, this is one of the dangers of going too far into the stuff. Like, I don't actually delve too deep into Freemasonry. I, I need to yeah. know the essence of it as taught by the church. Beyond that, I think it's unsafe curiosity. It's not really that important. Um, you know, do these people communicate through symbols that only they know? Yeah, I do believe they do. 
Um, but if we become obsessed with that kind of stuff, it's very, very dangerous. And the great danger is it externalizes the, the, the spiritual life. Mm-hmm. It says the source of evil is out there. But as great spiritual giants and saints, like, you know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn had this great line about the, the, the struggle between good and evil goes through every human heart. And who yes. wants to kill a part of his heart? You know, none of us want to. And so I, I gave a tax day speech April 15th. 2012, I think, you know, during the heyday of the Tea Party. And I read a letter from John Adams to Abigail Adams written on that very day in 1776. And John Adams basically said, raise our children to revere nothing but religion, morality, and liberty. And so I I made the point, I said to all these people, and it got very quiet when I said this, but people were majorly thanking me after. I said, look, we can do all these rallies. We can do all this political activism. But if in our families... We're not revering religion, morality, and liberty. If in our churches, in, 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 in our schools, in every other area of life, if we're not living the moral life and living in community, all the, you know, the virtues, all of this is for nothing. Yeah. All of this is for nothing. So that's my great worry with a lot of this QAnon obsession with Freemasonry type stuff, conspiracy theory, is it externalizes, you know, the greatest, in Prover- is it Proverbs or Ecclesiastes says, um, greater is a man who conquers himself than who conquers a city. And what a lot of this obsession with conspiracy theory does is it convinces people that the ultimate goal is to beat that, you know, city, yes. you know, metaphorically speaking, where it's like, no, it's to beat, it's to beat yourself with the help of God's grace, of course. And the danger is there for Catholics in private revelation, sadly. And, um, yeah, I've talked about that many times, but I'll hammer yeah. it home again. You know, there's this book that all women need to read, especially women. Um, and it, it, this this private, private revelation disproportionately, in my experience, affects women because it is much less logical. Not because women are less logical. Anyway, whatever. But it's because it's well, they are. But it's less. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's. I'm still celibate, so. <laughs> it's exactly. It's more relational. It's more feely. Like it's just a fact. You read Catherine Emmerich or Mary Vergreta or something like that, and it's like poetry. It's 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 almost romantic, okay? And that clearly, let's be honest, let's cast aside yeah. the stupid political correct. It just appeals to women more. And I've seen this where getting deep into this stuff, it it causes them uh, uh, in the same way that the QAnon you know, whatever deep dive on conspiracies in the sort of political sphere can take men into crazy rabbit holes. The same thing happens often to women in the church with these false preachers, these Father Rodrigue types, these 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 private revelation things, because, um, well, it, it basically offers them something like the Catholic rapture. You know, it offers them something yeah. like, you know, like if I, as long as I know the truth about this thing that nobody else understands, and as long as I'm part of this group, I'm going to, and, and one of the major promises is always, I'm going to avoid suffering. Yes. Whenever, whenever it's like, you know, do this like the three days of darkness, ladies and gentlemen. You gotta chill on that, okay? You gotta chill. If you tr- if you follow the logic of the three days of darkness all the way through, you should never leave your house because if you're caught at the grocery store and you don't have your blessed candles, you're screwed. That is not the way God operates. Realistically, the fact that we find three days of darkness and a bunch of these saints, it's probably because there's a three three and a half year period of darkness during the reign of the Antichrist. It's probably just an intuition appealing to that, and the light that you light is the light of your faith and your baptism, your confirmation. Yeah. this makes perfect sense to me. You interpret but it this... mystically, like you interpret scripture. Exactly. Anyway, okay, we have to stop because we're going to keep going forever and ever, and I have to finish recording a book for Taylor Marshall, and I gotta cut the grass, and I think you have something else to do. So we're going to do part two someday soon. We're going to talk about the Alta Vendita, Great. how we see this destruction of the papacy. In the church, and last joke I'll make, you said that the magisterium is the mouth of the church. Uh, well, that may, has a new meaning with Smoochy Fernandez saying he wants to heal us all with his mouth. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, you can find this book in the link to the description. You can find Josh Charles on Twitter. He's sort of using it like a blog at this point, putting full-length article things. Tell us where to find your stuff, Josh. Uh, JoshuaTCharles.com and yep. on Twitter, at JoshuaTCharles. Okay. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the book is in the link to the description and um, give it a purchase, support 10 books. This is a good one. All right, Josh, it's been a pleasure. Ladies Thank and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Kennedy. This is fun. It's wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, let me know what you think in the comments and I will respond if you write something nice and if it's not nice, I'll just ignore it. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.